The other thing that is embedded within this, those that will come behind Jesus and be able to do greater things, and this is specifically engaging the next generation of this church, those that are kind of in young adult world, high school, middle school, is that the way that they want to engage this world will be different than the way it has been engaged in the past. Specifically, I grew up in the church. I can remember in my mind the Sunday where this gentleman came off the mission field and he stood on our platform and, and I was in the back and I was in ninth grade and I can remember him saying this word that, that God is calling all of us to go and serve the world, serve the world. And people came forward, I remember that day, and they signed up to serve the world. The philosophical shift, though, that has taken place in generations is that students today are not motivated by serving the world. They are motivated by changing the world. And that's something that's hard for generations. When you pass that understanding down, you think we should go and we should serve. When we have a generation that's growing up knowing that whether they're in the church or not, they want to seek change. <laughs> and while I realize that you can say, well, Jason, that's how it was. I mean, and I often will have people come up and talk to me after I talk about generational transferring of vision. Well, that's how it was for me when I was in the 60s. I was in the 1960s. I was a young person in the church, and that older generation didn't understand me. So this isn't really anything new under the sun. I mean, this just happens. Yes, I would agree that generations have been changing, ongoing, 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 and that even smarter people than us in this room have studied how there's cycles of even generational change. <laughs> but here's the deal. We're at a Joshua... Two, Judges, excuse me, Joshua 24, Judges 2 kind of moment. I'm gonna explain that in a minute. But we're at a very critical juncture in the church going forward. We're at a critical juncture because we're at a place where we're very close to what other people have called post Christendom in the United States. And I don't join the group of people that only want to decry what the church is doing wrong. I want to try to focus on what we have within us and push that out in Christ's name. But we are at a juncture. We are at a very interesting spot in history. We have never been faster. We have never been more technologically advanced. We have never been redlined, so to speak, in the church, more so than we are in the United States now. What's going to happen next in the church, whether, and I don't mean just this church, but I mean the church in general, will, will predict how far we can go with this attitude and this aspect of mission. Do me a favor and let's take a look at a, a generational change that happened back in Joshua. If you go to Joshua chapter 24, if you want to see or you want to research some of the best generations that handed off from one to the next, right? The place to go is Moses and Joshua. The best handoff of any generation that I've seen. Moses, remember back in the day when he wanted to pick 12 spies to go spy out the promised land to see if we could make it. Joshua was one of the guys that came back out of the two and said, yep, we can take it. But because of the peer pressure and all the overwhelming facts against them, they said, no, we're not going in. But at that moment, I guarantee you, Moses put in the back of his head, that Joshua guy, he's a leader. I'm going to invest in him. And maybe didn't even know it then, but would start the trajectory of transferring leadership to Joshua. Now, please understand, when I talk about generations being handed over, the vision of God being handed over from one generation to the next, I'm not only talking about age. It's not about all gray-haired people handing it over to people that are on cell phones all the time. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is we're talking about a generational understanding of God. There is a shift in the way that the generation of the church has begun to understand Jesus, the work of Christ, to understand the power of God and the love of God. It's very different from when even my parents were young people in the church and probably very different from when your parents were young people if they were in the church. So we're at a generational handoff right now in North America. And it's at that place, if you know anything about um, uh, when you hand the baton off right to the next runner, there's this one quick moment, if you slow the baton handoff down, in which both hands are on the baton. It's a very, very important place. It's what wins or loses the race. And you've seen it, right? If you've watched the Olympics, you know that when they come to that critical juncture and we're looking at the United States runners, we're like, you just gotta just hand that thing off and we can keep on going, right? And how we feel when they drop it. I mean, can you imagine if the runner was approaching the box, if we're getting ready to receive the baton and the person like in front of them just decided to just like lob it up over their head so they had to run after it. Not only would it look ridiculous, but it would be illegal and it probably wouldn't win you the race. But there is a sense in that baton handoff right now in the church that that's what's happening. 
that we're just taking that baton and we're throwing it up when we're done with it and saying, whoever catches it can turn the lights off when they leave. It can't happen. Why? Because the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Where do we get the workers if not from here? But back to Joshua. In Joshua chapter 24, beginning in verse 28, we get a little bit of an obituary of Joshua's life. Joshua was a great leader. He was a God-fearing, very smart, charismatic, intelligent, strategic leader for the people of Israel. This is his legacy right here, beginning in verse 28. Then Joshua sent the people away, each to his own inheritance. And after these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Sarah, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Listen to this. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. That would be something that I would want said of me. I pray that it would be something that you would want said of you. That as you led your family, or you led this church, or you led something in this life, that the story of God, that the people of God understood who God was in that entire journey. And not only while you were around, but beyond you, one generation beyond you. So there was so much momentum in Joshua's leadership that it carried on through into the next generation. Beautiful. But if we turn the page, just one page in our Bible, to Judges chapter 2, we get to hear the end of the story. Judges 2, beginning in verse 6. This will kind, of re, it will kind of overlap what we just said, and it will carry us a little bit further. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Harris in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Okay, so there is um, conclusive evidence that both people are writing about the same thing. Now, next chapter, or excuse me, next paragraph. After that, though, a whole generation had been gathered to their fathers. In other words, they died. And another generation grew up behind them who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they served the Baals. Okay, as good as Joshua was, as strong as his leadership was to carry through his generation and the next, something happened though, which is where I find that we are precariously close in the church right now. We're at that place where generations of the church have grown the church in North America and pushed us into this generation, but we're at this really amazing juncture where something's going to happen, and here's what it is. People are gonna forget to tell the story. My thesis on the next generation is that they are a generation of storytellers. That is who they are. That is what they will do. They will tell stories. And that's not really too far. I mean, some of us go, oh, a story. But, you know, you need to be quoting scripture or we need to be proclaiming truth. I'm not talking about disavowing those things. But they in and of themselves, the makeup and the DNA of their generation is to tell the story, which is, links them right back to the Old Testament. How do you think this kind of information got to us? How do you think we know about Noah? How do you think we know about Moses? How do you think we know about Abram? How do you think we know about Jacob? How do you think we know about the creation of this world? Because the story was passed on. There was nothing to write on. There was no iPad or tablet to record it with. It was older generations of folks sitting around campfires with the next generation explaining to them Moses stood at the edge and he pushed his hands away and God moved the waters and Israel went through dry land. That is the storyteller's tradition. That is where our Old Testament comes from. This generation growing up in the church identifies very much with that. Case in point, for many of us, this thing that I'm holding in my hand right now is a way to make a phone call. But for the next generation, this is how we tell the story of God. Storytellers. Should be no surprise to us, we spend billions of dollars going to the movies every year. Why? Because it's great storytelling. Jesus himself was the best storyteller that ever lived. We call them parables because that kind of makes it more churchy, right? Because sometimes when we say story, what we think in our mind is it's false. It's something that has kind of like an Aesop's fable. It's got a motto at the end of it that we're supposed to adhere to. No, Jesus said, if you want to know about the kingdom of God, let me tell you a story. There once was this man. He found a field. Inside that field, he found this great treasure. 
As soon as he found it, he quickly covered it back up so nobody else would see it. He went and sold his house so that he could buy the field before anybody else did. And then he took possession of the treasure. And people are going, what? That's God? <laughs> Why would I want that? And he would engage in dialogue. And because of the story, people would understand who the person of God is. He was a storyteller. 